well. Now, on that note, let's take a somewhat deeper dive into the macro pool and look at some issues of the day with our guest speaker, Jim Bianco. Let me tell you about, a little bit about Jim. You know, every year at Altair when we talk about planning for the, spore of the forum and we think about who can provide us the most value for our audience, we ask ourselves, well, who do we admire? What other folks do we track on a regular basis? Of course, Altair has its own dedicated research team. We do a lot of research and writing, but we do keep a close watch on those we consider to be some of the smartest people in the industry. And luckily for us, one of those folks is right here in Chicago. So Jim Bianco is very well known for his unique and original insights into movements in the financial markets. He's founder and president of Bianco Research, and he has his own weekly teleconferences that attract hundreds of investment advisors, money managers, and traders. Jim is very sought after as a market, commenta a market commentator and regularly featured in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Barron's, so on and so forth, uh, and has been on uh, CNN, CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox, and of course, the CFA Society of Chicago. We've been fortunate to have Jim speak. Uh, at Altair, we've been following Jim's work for many years, and while his primary focus is on the fixed income markets, his research really spans the gamut from the effects of commodity prices on bond yields to the role of government regulation in setting interest rates. Prior to starting Bianco Research, Jim spent five years in New York City with several prominent investment banking firms, saw the light, came back to Chicago. Uh, Jim has a uh, he lives in Chicago, has four uh, kids, has a Bachelor of Science degree in, f in finance from Marquette up the road, and an MBA from Fordham University. Now, to make sure that we get the most out of our time with Jim, and we have until 1.30, and we promise we'll get you out on time, uh, Jim's going to spend about 35, 40 minutes or so addressing us directly, and then I'm going to join him on the stage. We'll take questions from the audience. Um, if you have questions, though, during Jim's presentation, write them down. Anna Nichols, our Director of Communications, will pick them up, and we'll have a, a rip-roaring session. So please join me in welcoming Jim Bianco. Thanks, Steve. Um, and thank everybody. Uh, the uh, handout? Am I supposed to do this? Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to talk about macro issues, big picture issues, as far as uh, where I see the, the markets going and the economy going. And I'm going to cover about five or six different issues. I want to talk a little bit about some of the interesting things that have happened in the bond market, some of the things that's going on with the Federal Reserve, um, some of the things that are going on with the economy, um, and both foreign economies and um, uh, the U.S. economy. Touch on them about five or six minutes, and then if you've got any questions about it in the, uh, if you've got any questions about it at the end, I'll uh, talk, uh, I'll take Q&A. Right, this is my handout real in the high-speed version, because in the back I have bigger pictures that you can actually see, which are right there. Okay, so the bond market, if you are not an investor in the bond market, something extraordinary happened on October 15th. That was the day the Dow looked like it was down 500 points for a couple of times during the day. The bond market went from, this is the 10-year U.S. yield, it went from 220 to 185 to 220 in the space of about two hours. That would be normally a good year, which it did before, uh, you know, morning coffee it, on, the, on the day of October 15th. Uh, and you could see how this chart here shows you the last three years of data, and here's the one day right there. A little bit of a, a different picture on that. What happened in the bond market that day, and how is it affecting a lot of people? The bond market trades on an over-the-counter basis. It doesn't trade on a listed exchange like stocks do. Because stocks trade on a listed exchange, there's been a movement in the last seven or eight years to automate stock trading. Something like 75% of stock trading right now is done by computers. Humans don't make the decisions, computers do. Algorithmic trading is a very big part of that. Algorithmic trading is where the computers are, they literally read the stories um, that are coming across, look at market action in related markets, 
and make the decisions to buy or sell. Uh, this is catching up in the bond market, be, uh, slower pace because it's not, it's not centralized like stocks, but somewhere near half of bond trading right now is computerized to the point now where people are starting to get it that tomorrow morning when we get the employment data, the, before it's done pixelating on the screen that you're looking at, the computers have read that data, analyzed that data, and probably fired off a few hundred trades uh, at that point. That's how the market's going. So we get into these circumstances, which we saw on the 15th, where the markets are weak, and the, and the data is weak, and we've got an eye-popping story that Ebola has been found in the United States, and, every, and it's not just one, it's not just Ebola. Everything comes together, the computers all make a decision, we need to buy a safe asset, treasuries. And they all in the same minute try and buy them, and they drive the yield from 220 down to 185, and then they realize what they did, and they try and get out of it, and it goes from 185 back to 220 in the space of about two or three hours. Now this happened a couple of years ago in the stock market, which we refer to as the flash crash. I guess we're referring to this as the flash yield crash because in actuality they were all trying to buy bonds. Uh, so the, the yield is, is what crashed. Now why is this important? Because all year long we have been talking about when interest rates are going to go up. Here's a, here's a table that does, it, it's a monthly survey from Bloomberg. Let's just focus on the bottom line. October 8th was the last time they did the monthly survey. They'll do it again in the beginning of next week. They interviewed 73 economists, or 73 economists filled out their survey. 100% of 73 economists said that interest rates would be higher in six months. 100%. The month before was 96, 100, 100, 99, 99, 100, 97, 95, 97, and that's the whole year. Chris Lowe at FTN Financial is one of the few economists that is bullish on interest rates, and when he goes on vacation, it goes to 100%, and when he fills out the survey, it's 97%. But other than that, in the country of 318 million people, I guess there's nobody else but the title of economist that thinks interest rates are going to go down. That's why the things that happen like the flash crash become significant, because if you are lined up very heavily one side in a belief that, well, interest rates are going up, and then you get that flash crash, it could be very, very painful. Uh, and that's what we saw happened with a lot of fixed income managers in the last couple of weeks. This is a, uh, a survey that JP Morgan does of their clients, the percentage that are underweight treasuries. That means less duration for those of you in the bond market or are positioning for higher interest rates. 42% was the high that we saw. That was, a, that was a, an eight-year high. You have to go back to 2006 on September 15th. And then we had the flash crash, and now we've gone all the way down in at least the most recent surveys, we've almost had that number down to 22 percent. Uh, and so it was, for the fixed income world, a jarring experience, what we saw in the bond market, because we're starting to see people now start to realize that, you know what, while I understand the fundamentals and I understand the reasons the rates are going to go up, maybe they won't, and this messy chart that I have next will try to, you know, this, this becomes a little bit more in context. These, all these gray lines, these are the year-to-date total returns in the bond market. And I highlighted just a couple of different colors on there. This thick black line right here is 2014. Through a couple of days ago, last time I updated this chart, if you had owned 30-year bonds, you would be up 22% for the year. Of all the years since 1974, that's 41 years, this ranks as the fourth best year to ever own bonds other than a couple of them were 2011, 1986, 1985, and this year. And 100% of economists are telling you to get out of the bond market, and it's one of the best years ever to own bonds, and we just had a yield panic flash crash where we drove rates down to 185 uh, and really in inflicted quite a bit of pain on everybody else. So the bond market is now in the process, I think, of a bit of a capitulation. The capitulation is a two-step process. The first step in the capitulation, oops, I hit the wrong button there. The first step in the capitulation was all the silicon-based traders realized the mistake they made about 9.30 on the morning of October 15th when they all panicked and bought and they were saying, you know, why did, I, why did I just buy everything at 185 and tried to get out of the trade and go to 220 
and the programmers are busily trying to rewrite their program so they don't make that mistake again. We'll see if they're successful in doing it because they would have told me on October 14th they had written their programs that that wouldn't happen, and then it happened, and now they're going to now they're going to assure me again that it definitely won't happen next time. We'll see how that happens. Now the carbon-based traders, all the human beings, they're now starting to rethink what they saw happen, and they're kind of having a little bit more of an open mind about what the bond market could do. And that gets me to the Fed. QE. Let's start off with talking about what the purpose of QE is, and let's quote some guy who might know a little bit about QE. His name is Ben Bernanke. Uh, he wrote an op-ed on November 4th, 2010, in the Wall Street, um, excuse me, in the Washington Post, in the Washington Post. That was the day the Fed, the day after the Fed announced that they were going to do QE2. And in it, he said the following, easier financial conditions will promote economic growth. For example, lowered mortgage rates will make housing more affordable and allow more homeowners to refinance. Lower corporate bond rates will encourage investment. And then the key part here. And higher stock prices will boost consumer wealth and help increase confidence, which can also spur spending. Increased spending will lead to higher incomes and profits that, in a virtuous circle, will further support the economic expansion. So to translate what Bernanke said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to buy bonds, we, us being the Fed, so you don't have to. You're going to all go buy stocks. And we're going to ram stocks up as high as we can and everybody's going to feel disgustingly wealthy and spend all of those profits, and the economy's going to then expand its well, and it's going to justify those high stock prices. The Fed got half of what they wanted. They did buy bonds. They did move everybody out the risk curve, and they bought corporate bonds and equities, and, and they did push up those prices, and even through today, earlier this morning, when you had the ECB, hint around that they might do QE, you had an immediate response in all markets around the world, including the U.S., to leap higher because the markets love the, the prospects of more easy money. So we got that part. But we didn't get the, what we'll refer to as the wealth effect part. Now that everybody opens their statements and they see that they're worth more money, or if you run an, a company and you see that the value of your company has increased, Nobody was running down to the mall to spend money. Nobody was, was putting out want ads to hire more people because the values of their companies went up. Why? Well, up the road here at the University of Chicago, Milton Friedman told us in the late 1950s when he talked about the permanent income hypothesis. Asset values can be viewed as another source of income. Think of your house before 2008. And when it went up in value, it was like another bonus check. But you have to view it as permanent. If you think it's temporary, well, the market's going up. I don't want it to go down. I'm happy it's going up. I'd like it to go higher. But am I going to withdraw some of that money and expend it on myself? And if I see the value of my company go up, does that mean that it's going to encourage me to uh, expand my business, hire more people? Only if I think it's permanent. And I keep reading that it's all driven by the Federal Reserve and they may change their policy and a lot of, and so I'm not sure it's permanent. That's why we haven't gotten the wealth effect that has been attached to the higher markets. So no one's unhappy the markets are going up. They're just not doing circa 2006. Your house went up in value, you took out a home equity loan, you ran down to the car dealership, you bought a, a new car, you ran down to the mall, you bought one of those new fancy flat screen TVs, when we used to pay $5,000 for them, now we pay 600 bucks for them. And, you know, and, that, and that's what you did back in 2006, because when your house went up in value, it never went down again. It was at that level and it would just go up again. But now you're not so sure, and that's why this is the big stumbling block to what Bernanke was looking for, that virtuous circle. Prices go up, people spend more money, the economy and profits go up to justify those higher prices. So they could go up, 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 and that's not what's been happening in the market. And you can kind of see that, and this is a version of the chart that Steve showed you. All these different colors on the chart are the different iterations that the Fed did of QE. And I'll focus on three areas of the chart, the gray areas, here, here, and this, Steve uh, had this highlighted, and here. Collectively, since 2009, the market is up 128% through October 27th, last time I updated this chart. When the Fed was doing QE, it's up 156% collectively. When the Fed was not doing QE, when it ended at QE1, ended QE2, or threatened to stop Operation Twist, the market is collectively down 27%.
So this is this sugar high that we've been referring to in the market. The Fed is pushing the market. It is hoping that we would get some kind of a, uh, a wealth effect. Now, a lot of the defenders of QE, Paul Krugman, as it comes to mind, recognize this temporary permanence problem. And Krugman has a phrase for this that he likes to throw out there. That in order for QE to work, now Krugman's argument is, is that QE works if you do it in big enough and bold enough strokes. And actually this week he's in Japan and he met with Abe and he met with Kuroda, the head of the Bank of Japan, and he's been praising them because on a GDP basis, their new program of QE is five times the size of the Fed's program. It would be the equivalent of the Fed buying $400 billion worth of securities a month is what Japan is about to do. Uh, if you were to put it in U.S. terms, when we peaked out at $85 billion a month. But Krugman would say that in order for QE to work, you have to be responsibly irresponsible. That's the phrase he likes to use. Responsible that you won't go off the deep end and create hyperinflation, but irresponsible so that you look like you might go off the deep end and create hyperinflation, but pull it back. So Krugman's argument, if you want to put it in these terms, is he'd say, you know why you don't have a wealth effect with the Dow at 17,000? Because you need to push it to 25 or 30,000, and then people will spend as if 17,000 is the floor. And that has been a tough one for the Fed to swallow. They're not ready to go all in on that kind of thinking. Japan is, and Japan will be the good laboratory experiment for everybody. And we'll see how that one works out. And I'll talk a little bit more about Japan in a second. But let me finish up on the Fed. Bullard speaks. Jim Bullard is the St. Louis Federal Reserve president. He is interesting because he's one of the few guys that speaks his mind. Um, kind of, you know, shoots from the hip a little bit. And the question is, does he say things that other people at the Fed think but won't say out loud? So on October 19th, he came out in an interview on Bloomberg and he said, if the economy is still as robust as I'm describing, then I think we should just end the program in December. He's talking about QE. They ended it October 28th, but he said, um, let's look at the possibility of ending it in December. But if the market is right and it's pretending something worse, more serious in the U.S. economy, then the committee would have the option of ramping up QE at that point. Translated, the market is down. We need to print more money. And that was what, and like I said, thank you for pointing out what we all think from the previous chart I showed you. Wall Street has been struggling with this. The Fed, at the end of the day, are they just an emotional reaction to the last 10 days in the market? Market had a bad two weeks, and then here comes Bullard, and he says, well, maybe we should start um, printing more money. In fact, Bullard further compounded this yesterday by coming out yesterday and saying, I don't think we need any more QE. Well, okay, so uh, now the market had a good 10-day period, and now we don't need more QE. When it has a bad 10-day period, it, you want more QE. Rosengren, um, Eric Rosengren, the Boston St. Louis Fed president, well, Boston, Boston Fed president, came out in an interview on the 27th, and he said, we'll have to think exactly about what's appropriate wording, and certainly the financial context were given the volatility we've seen in the market, we're going to have to weigh how to best avoid further unsettling markets that seems to have unsettled, um, unsettled themselves pretty well on their own. Translated, it's the Fed's fault for not being clear on what they want to do that the markets were a little bit wobbly. This is a problematic vortex that the Fed is getting themselves caught into right now, that they, they insist that quantitative easing is about creating jobs, creating GDP, but more and more of their members keep talking about what the stock market did the last five days and how quantitative easing should respond to it or not respond to it. And this gets to this whole issue of does QE work? And the, the problem with does QE work, first of all, let me give you a, a little um, uh, disclaimer about does QE work. In my position, I've read just about everybody's analysis that I could see on does QE work, and I have now read every possible permutation. It doesn't work, it works, it sort of works, and it sort of works in a million different ways. Translated, no one has any idea if this program is working or not. Uh, and I tend to think of the analysis that I'm reading tends to reflect more of the political ideology of the writer than actually does the program work. So. 
I'll answer the question, and what I'm going to do is give you my political ideology in answering it. Does the program work? I don't see any evidence that it's worked in creating jobs or creating GDP. Does it work in distorting financial markets? You bet it works in distorting financial markets. The big question then is, can the Fed get all the way out? Can they get all the way out, not just stop buying bonds, but raise interest rates off of zero to some normal level, which, depending on who you talk to, is somewhere between 3 and 4 percent, and do that without creating problems in the economy? I don't know how they can do that. I think the Fed doesn't know how they can do that. And that's why the question is, when is the Fed going to raise rates? The Wall Street answer is in six months. The Wall Street answer has been in six months for four years. And they will continue to say in six months until they finally raise rates, and then they'll say, like I told you six months ago, I'm Nostradamus at this point. My answer has been, just to make poke fun at Wall Street, they will never raise rates, but I'll rev hold off to revise that to a date in the future. And what I'm trying to say there is, I think they're going to be very, very slow in raising rates. They are going to only raise rates when zero interest rates is the problem. As long as we are at zero interest rates and there is not perceived to be a problem because we're at zero interest rates, then that means inflation. There's no hurry to raise rates. They're not going to raise rates in the middle of next year unless there's an inflation problem. They'll find another reason to, do, to stall it off. And how do I know that? Because that's what they've done every other time in the future. If you look back to the beginning of late last year, a year ago, the Fed was using what was called thresholds. When the unemployment rate gets to under 6.5%, we'll revisit whether or not we want to do this program. Well, by February, it shot through to 6.4%, and then the Fed said, well, you can forget that. Well, we're on to other arguments as well, too. And it was only in October when they finally got rid of the program. And the Fed has repeatedly done this over and over again. Every time they, they put a line in the sand and then the market steps over it, they always put another line in the sand towards being easier. They have yet to ever say, we're going to be more dovish. That is compounded with what you're going to see with the Fed next year. There are seven governors on the Federal Reserve Board, of which five of the seats are filled. The other two are open right now, waiting for the president to uh, appoint somebody for those seats. And some people think that that will be the job of the next president, that they might be open for another two more years. And that's actually a reasonable argument. Those five will vote. Of the 12 bank presidents, and one of them here is in Chicago, uh, the five of them vote on a rotating basis. So we have five governors and we have five presidents voting at any particular time, five of the 12, 10 voters. We should have 12 if we had seven governors, but we only have five governors. Next year's composition of bank presidents is about as dovish a makeup as you could make. It just, the calendar worked out that way, that all of the very dovish presidents that don't want to raise rates are all the voters next year. All the hawkish presidents that want to raise rates, they're not voting next year. So on top of everything else, you're going to have a very dovish mix in the Fed next year. So when is the Fed going to raise rates? When zero, zero interest rates, is perceived as the problem. That's not perceived as a problem now. It's not going to be perceived as a problem anytime soon. I think it's going to be much longer than the Fed thinks. Let me uh, pivot a little bit in the macro space, talk a little bit about the U.S. economy for a couple of minutes. Economists like to have a phrase called uh, potential GDP versus real. So this line, and this comes from um, the St. Louis Federal Reserve, the blue line on this, uh, the red line on this chart is the trillions of dollars of GDP that the economy has created from 1948 to 2008. I stopped the chart in 2008. So it goes up and down in all the shaded areas of recessions. The blue line on this chart is what's called real potential GDP. What should the economy grow at? I'm going to give you a simple definition of potential GDP. If no one's doing anything to the U.S. economy, they're not trying to stimulate it, they're not trying to slow it down, what's its natural growth rate? The perception is its natural growth rate is 2.5%. So the blue line is nothing but an econometric formula, just grows at 2.5%. And guess what? For 50 years, that was actually a pretty good indicator of where the U.S. economy would go. In periods when it would grow under, the red line would get under the blue line, you'd have a recession, and then it would catch up, and you'd have another recession, and then it would catch up. And that worked well for 50 years. Now, let's look at the last 10 years. Here's that potential line again, and here's real, here's real GDP. 
We took a big hit in the economy during the, during the panic and the, uh, the, or the Great Recession in 2007 to 2009, and we've been growing in parallel with potential. We're not closing that gap. Every other time the economy undershot, it would immediately bounce back and close that gap. It's not closing that gap right now. That's the subpar problem that economists are talking about. If I was to use a, an analogy for you here, it would be like if you were a marathon runner and you broke your leg and it healed, and now you find out you can't run as fast as you used to be able to. And that seems to be what's happening with the economy. It broke its leg, its leg healed, but it cannot catch up to its previous self is what's happening. And that is the problem that it has. This actually is an academic argument, but it has profound investment implications as well, too. If the U.S. economy cannot, and I've got that green dotted line, catch up to potential GDP, and maybe here's a better way of looking at it. Here's the 2.5% growth rate, this green line here. This goes back 30 years. All the blue bars on this chart are whenever the economy on a year-over-year -year basis grew above 2.5%, and all the red bars are when it grew less than 2.5%. You'll notice all the red bars in the last six or seven years. Only a handful of times did it shoot up for a quarter or two above the 2.5%, only to settle back down under it. So why can't the economy, oops, why can't the economy get back to 2.5%? If you will, to use another metaphor, 2.5% is a C. That's your kid getting a C in school. You want to be above a C, B or A economy. That's what you saw in the 90s, what you saw in the 80s, even what you saw in the 2000s. You were well above that. You were getting Bs and As. That's where I've been using the metaphor that this is like a C minus economy. We're not in recession. We are growing. But we could do better. And to use the follow on that metaphor, most of us in this room, if our kids came home with a C minus, they pass their class, they get to go to the next grade, they get to graduate, but nobody's happy with a C minus. You sit them down at the kitchen table and you say, you know what, we've got to do better than this. And that's what this economy is. It's passing its classes, it's going to the next grade, it's going to graduate, but it's really not doing as well as we, as well as we have hoped that it would do. And if you look at more recent periods, the Atlanta Fed does a thing called GDP tracking. And all this does here is it shows us where the economy is. GDP is a summation statistic. It's a big summation statistic of a lot of other numbers. And if you look at all the numbers that go into the inputs of GDP, it's been running under 3% is what the tracking numbers are, are running under. But they reported a 3.5% GDP last week. Why? Because when the first number came out, about 40% of the data that you need for GDP was available. They guesstimate for the other 60%. And the data that has been coming in, even in the last week, has been disappointing. So now economists are back to thinking that this economy is growing again in the mid twos. Uh, and this is supposed to be the period where it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's supposed to break out. So what you have happening here is we have yet another year, and this is a survey done by Bloomberg over time of a bunch of economists asking what they think full year GDP forecast is going to be in another year of low twos, another year under two and a half, another year of C minus on the economy. Now, to sum this up with Fed policy, the Fed keeps pumping money into the system, pushing up the stock market, hoping for a wealth effect, and uh, it doesn't seem to ever get the wealth effect, and we seem to have an economy that is doing okay C plus or so, but not great. But we have markets that are doing A plus. And the markets are doing A plus because of all the stimulus that they're getting, but that breeds a sense of temporariness in the economy. Let me uh, traverse the world here in my five minutes or so that I have before we take Q&A. Japan, let me revisit Japan. Japan has been engaged, Japan actually invented the phrase quantitative easing 14 years ago in 2000 when they were trying to get their economy out of the doldrums, uh, they, they tried QE and it, has, it hadn't been working much since then. And uh, what, we see with, uh, what we see with Japan is in the year ending in June, they still had negative growth, even though they've had massive QE. And the expectations, according to another Bloomberg survey, is 2014 will be a 1% year for the, for the Japanese economy. 
And this chart shows you the balance sheet of the Bank of Japan. It can't go any steeper than this, and it's going to continue to go up and up and up and up and probably hit the ceiling in about two years at the rate that they're going to go to try and stimulate their economy. The Japanese, by the way, are now going to buy nearly half the bonds that they're going to be issuing by the, the government's going to be issuing to finance Japan. They're going to be buying stocks. They're going to be buying U.S. stocks. They're going to be buying real estate. It, before it's all over with, they'll probably be buying used cars and furniture if they can in order to try and stimulate their economy as well. And the, so the Japanese are all in right now, and they are going to buy everything that's not nailed down with printed money from the Bank of Japan. And about all it's really accomplished is even though their economy has been suffering, even though they have been in uh, flirting with deflation, their market has actually done very well. It's gone above 17,000 for the first time in over a decade. Uh, and, and that's what you get out of QE. You get very good markets, but whether or not you actually get jobs and, and GDP is another issue. Quick word on Europe. Europe, just to give you an idea of what's been happening in Europe. So here's an index of industrial production, the blue line in the United States, and an index in the Eurozone. And you can see that something happened around 2010, 2011, that the Eurozone has really suffered badly, and the U.S. has not. In fact, the Eurozone's industrial production right now is still materially lower than their output right now is still materially lower than it was in 2007. Maybe to put this in more of a context, here's auto production. Auto production in the United States has bounced back into the low 16 millions. That's roughly the range we saw during the 2000s. This chart goes back to 1994. European auto production is now under 9 million. You have to go back to the early 1980s to find the last time that European auto production was that low. And if you look at the forecast, the forecast for this is now 2015, they're coming down quite rapidly in terms of what's been happening in Europe as well too. And then finally, if you look at inflation expectations, there are markets that you can trade, that the inflation-protected securities markets, those have been falling right rapidly too, suggesting there's more inflation. Now Europe, like Japan, but more so Europe, really becomes an interesting play because if you want to find cheap stocks, you have to go where there's problems. Steve showed you the difference between um, GM and Mercedes and Exxon and Total. And this is the way it works. In the investing world, the most money is made when something goes from bad to good. When it goes from very good to great, there isn't as much money to be made as going from bad to good. So what these European charts show, I think, are two things. One, they've got a lot of problems in Europe, and they're going to continue to have a lot of problems in Europe. Two, that means there's a lot of cheap stocks in Europe right now. And there's opportunities out there. Now, does that mean that they're going to immediately start going higher tomorrow? No, not necessarily. But you might be getting paid to wait in Europe right now. Because that's what you need to see. If you want to find cheap stocks, you need to see charts like this. Their industrial production is terrible, 20-year low in auto production. Uh, everybody's flirting with recession. The, the, the central bank is panicking because things are never going to get better. That's where you find cheap stocks and you could find a lot of cheap stocks in Europe. Um, lastly, the dollar. If you, look at the economic, if you look at the economic textbooks, they will tell you that the way that the dollar should trade is a relative ratio on interest rates. So you look at the interest rates of one country, and you look at the interest rates of the other country, and you know the higher countries, the, will, the, current, the exchange rate will appreciate towards the higher country. What happens, and let's talk about reference rates of the central bank set rates. What happens when all those interest rates are at zero, which is what they are right now? Then it becomes the relative size of the balance sheets, which country's printing money faster than the other country that's printing money. And so on this chart here, uh, the red line here on this chart is the relative size of the Fed's balance sheet to the European Central Bank's balance sheet. And overlaid on this chart is the dollar euro. And the expected path of the balance sheets because the Fed has stopped with QE and the ECB is going to start QE. The expected path is that it will go down. The market has sought that out and you've seen that the, uh, the euro has been falling relative to the dollar or the dollar has been pretty strong on that. The Bank of England is the same way. The blue line on this is the relative size of the Bank of England's balance sheet to the Fed's. 
uh, or um, it, uh, the red line, excuse me, is the Bank of England's balance sheet to the Feds. It's expected to go down. The pound has been weakening relative to the dollar as well, too. So why is the dollar so strong? Because we stopped printing money, and all the other central banks are in the process of gearing up their printing presses um, as well, too. Where does that come in right away in terms of the investment decision? There's two points about the investment decision. One is that uh, I think in some respects the dollar has been uh, unknown and understood that it uh, is going up. So that's been somewhat discounted in the market. But two, let's look at the S&P 500. Roughly 200 companies in the S&P 500 will break down their, foreign, their sales by foreign versus domestic. Of those 200 companies that report it, 300 companies won't break it down. 45% uh, of their sales is overseas. If the dollar is going to strengthen materially, it's not a good idea to have an overseas operation. Uh, Expedia is a good example there. A couple days ago, they reported their earnings, and they guided downward their earnings because most of the, the over 50% of Expedia's uh, revenues come from overseas, people online booking trips. And they're now doing business in countries where their currencies are going down. And so when they translate those currencies back to dollars, it's less and less and less. So they guided the street down and said, we thought we were going to earn, we thought we were going to see revenue growth of about 20 to 25 percent year over year, but because the dollar's been so strong, these other currencies have been so weak, more like 15 to 20 percent, and the stock blew up on that news. But I think you're going to see more of that. What this chart shows here is that since the dollar has started to strengthen, there hasn't been a reaction in the marketplace. There, this is just how the percentage of overseas revenues relative to the stock returns, and there is no relationship. That's all I'm trying to show. This won't last. There will be a relationship. So if you think the dollar is going to continue to go higher, and I do because we're not printing money and the rest of the world is, then I do think that it's going to start to affect companies that have higher and higher percentages of revenues, that has not happened yet. But I think that that will start to happen in the markets in the uh, coming future. Uh, real quick on earnings, and then I'll wrap this up in two minutes. This has been another hobby horse of ours as we go through the macro world. The percentage of companies that beat on the earnings line. So far, as of October 31st, 362 companies reported 76% of companies have beaten. The last time less than 50% of companies have beaten on earnings was the fourth quarter of 1997, something like 70 quarters ago. How come it's always at 70%? And the, the, the blunt answer is, this is a rigged game on Wall Street. Wall Street will always cut their earnings forecasts, so the company will guide them. Company will say, you know what, Wall Street, we think we're going to earn 40 cents this quarter. And Wall Street will say, great, we're going to predict 35. And then they're going to earn 40, and then, the, and then everybody go, hallelujah, you beat the estimates. And three quarters of the companies beat the estimates. It happens every quarter. Even the third quarter of 2008, which the quarterly financial statement was invented by the Securities Act of 1934, and the worst quarterly performance ever reported was the third quarter of 2008, when collectively the companies in the S&P 500 lost almost a trillion dollars, led by the huge bank write-offs. 60% of the companies still beat earnings estimates, even when they were in full, full de decline at that point. So the first thing is the beat rate, which if you, if you have this disease like I do and you watch too much CNBC, uh, and, you know, they will always act every day like, wow, they beat. You know, and I used to say the way that CNBC should report uh, is that uh, you know, company X is going to report their numbers in five minutes. Let's see how much they beat it by, because they always do. It's not, it's not anything new. So this is a game that Wall Street plays. And that's why what you see happen with the growth rate, uh, the earnings expectations, is this is the year-over-year -year expectations, Q3 to Q3 of earnings. It goes down, down, down until earnings season starts, and then it check marks up a little bit at the end of earnings season because everybody beats. This pattern has been repeated over and over again for 10 years um, on, on Wall Street. Uh, but if you look at revenues, Companies don't gain revenues, and revenues can give us a better indication of what's going on. They do vacillate above and below 50%. Now, if analysts are trying to be right, 
Sometimes they get it too high, sometimes they get it too low, and over long periods of time, it averages out to 50%. Well, instead of 77% of companies beating on uh, earnings, we have 50% of companies beating on revenues, 50-50. It's what I expect the analysts to do if they're actually trying, instead of gaming the system. And the bit more worrisome thing about it is, is that year-over-year -year revenue growth, sales growth of the S&P 500 companies, is down around 3.5%. Earnings are 8 Revenue growth is 3.5%. What makes up the difference? Largely buybacks makes up the difference. So companies have been using cheap money, zero interest rates, to borrow, borrow, borrow. The, if you've seen issuance numbers in the bond market, they've been booming. And then they've been buying back their share, reducing their float so the EPSs go up. This is consistent, the earnings number, or the revenue numbers are consistent with that C minus world that I was talking about. The revenue numbers, they're okay at 8%. The long term average over the last 60 years is around 9 or 10. So 8% is definitely something there as well, too. All right, I'm over my time limit, so let me just end here. We do sell research for a living. This is the last page of your handout if you want to take a look at our research. You can go to our website, put in that code, and you can take a test drive through November 22nd. So let me thank you all, and I guess we'll start a little bit of a Q&A thing right now. If you have any questions, uh, Anna will come by and collect them. We have about 15 minutes or so, um, and I know that uh, Certainly, politics, uh, we've had a, a lot of that. We've had a lot of commercials, uh, but none in the last couple of days. But one question, Jim, that we'd like your input on is uh, now that the elections are over, now that Republicans are in control of both houses, last time I checked, though, uh, we still have a Democrat in the White House. Uh, what do you think, uh, if anything, uh, the impact will be in the investment markets of the elections? Uh, little to none. And little to none because, and I'll argue to you that the focus is in the wrong place. I know what the Republicans are going to do. I know what they would have done 10 years ago. I know what Republicans stand for and what they believe. They believe in less taxes, lower regulations, and the like. That's what they're going to do. The question is, is how much is the president going to accept? Is he going to be like Bill Clinton when he lost the House in 1994 and he did this famous triangulation? and actually signed the welfare reform bill and worked with the Republicans? Or is the president going to view himself as a break on a Republican agenda? And just um, as Ted Cruz said the other day, we'll just keep sending him bills and he could keep vetoing them until the pen runs out of ink. And unfortunately, I think the latter. He's going to keep vetoing them. Now, there's going to be a couple of quick test cases coming up real soon. The Republicans have announced that within the first 24 hours of the new Congress, they're going to send him a bill to build the Keystone Pipeline. Okay, let's see if he signs that. If he does, then maybe we'll see a little bit more. If he doesn't, uh, then it's more of the same. And also whether or not he actually follows through on his promise to do immigration. So the bottom line is, I guess I've seen some statistics where the current Congress has passed 190 bills which is like the lowest total for a Congress to pass in many generations. I forgot which one the last time it was that low, but it's been generations. The next one could probably break that record unless we see some moderation from the president. Like I said, I know what a Republican is. I know what they're going to send him. Uh, and, uh, and if he's just going to just veto, 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 nothing's going to come of it. So we'll see, but I'm not optimistic that it's going to change. It's going to be more of the same. So on, on that note, when we look at the United States, Europe, Japan, uh, we keep hearing that there needs to be, in addition to monetary policy, uh, some sort of structural reform. Uh, maybe that's why we're not seeing the GDP. So how do we get to structural reform in the US and Europe and Japan, if ever? Well, you know, you're right. And the problem is the structural reforms in a lot of those other countries is a lot harder to accomplish. Let me take Japan. They desperately need corporate structural reform. Uh, to give you an in indication of the problems in Japan, is the, the, the Nikkei, as I mentioned in my presentation, their stock market index just went above 17,000 for the first time in many, many years. Its all-time high was 1989, was 25 years ago at 38,000, 25 years ago, and now they're at 17,000. There's 225 companies in the Nikkei 225. 
one third of the chairmen of the current Nikkei 225 companies were senior managers of the chairman 25 years ago. The problem with Japan is that the average age of a chairman of their company, so I think, is like 117. They got to roll these guys over. You know, rightly or wrongly, when we have a financial crisis, people go out, new people come in, things change. It's a dynamic system. They have no dynamic system in Japan, and they just continue to have the same 97-year-old guys talking to their younger 92-year-old guys to try and figure out what they're going to do because they've all been running the companies since the late 1950s. And in, until they're ready to change that, nothing's going to change in Japan. That is the structural reform they've got to get to. Europe's structural reform problem is a little bit more complicated. What we're learning about Europe is they have one central bank, they have one currency, and they have 17 countries. That structure doesn't work. What's the answer to that structure? Is it one government that they, you know, stop calling yourself French, stop calling yourself Italian, stop calling yourself German, start calling yourself European and tell me that your capital is Brussels? Haven't they fought a war once a generation for a thousand years to prevent that exact thing from happening? Or break it all up and go back to the old system of a, every, every, if you drive through Europe every two hours, you got to change currency and languages. Um, they have a very difficult road to hoe because they got no good answer there. And I think that that's where their problem really comes down to. One of the problems that Draghi has in trying to do quantitative easing is they don't know how to do it. What is he supposed to buy? Uh, is he supposed to buy German bonds? No, don't buy German bonds, okay? Uh, but then if you ask the Italians, they say, well, you need to buy Italian bonds. And if you ask the French, they say, you need to buy French bonds. And they argue among each other. How many French bonds are we going to buy? How many Italian bonds are we going to buy? And they can never come to a conclusion on anything. So yes, they need structural reform. But in Europe, it is, they've put themselves in such an intractable place with one currency and 17 governments that I don't know where that structural reform is going to come from. Uh, a unified government, that's easy to say, but try and sell that to the European people. Going back to the legacy currencies, calling the whole thing off, that's a disaster as well, too. So they're in a tough spot right now. We'll go to the audience, but I want to ask uh, Jim, because I know you had a slide on oil. Yes. And uh, we've had uh, tremendous uh, declines in oil prices, energy prices. Uh, what do you view that uh, in terms of its impact on the economy? Is it a good thing, bad thing? Uh, that's the, that's the $64,000 question on Wall Street. Oil is going down. Why? There's a school of thought that says oil is going down because it's reflecting a slowing world economy. Demand is falling for oil, so the price is adjusting to itself. If that's the case, falling oil prices is not a good thing. Oil is going down because there's more supply of it. Uh, fracking, horizontal drilling, and, and the like has created a glut of supply. If that's the reason oil is going down, it's a very good thing. Now, Wall Street is really split on this argument. I'm in the demand argument that it's going down because of falling demand. The, the supply story is right. There's more supply, but there was more supply in late August. And in late August, the price of crude oil was $107 a barrel. Now here we are in early November, and the price is $78 a barrel. There wasn't some magic supply number that was found between August and November. What has changed since August and November is the perception that the world economy is slowing down, and that's why oil is falling. Now, the silver lining for the United States in that is most of that has been perceived to be driving by China is slowing, Europe is slowing, Japan is slowing. The U.S. isn't. So they're dragging down the price, and it's somewhat beneficial for us. That's a different argument, too. But net-net for the world and net-net, I would prefer to see a strong economy in rising oil prices because that means that demand is going and people want this product as opposed to what we're seeing now because I fear what it's telling us is things aren't going as well as we thought they were. Oil can be viewed as an economic indicator in that respect. And if it is, going down may not necessarily be the most bullish thing in the world. Except if you're selling SUVs, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Anna, do we have some questions uh, from the floor? OK. So question is, uh, one is, can we close the GDP gap, and how and when? We have to understand why that GDP gap is there. 
I still think that the reason that that GDP gap is still there is that sense of temporariness. I think what's holding back a lot of people is the perception that um, what um, Paul Singer of Elliott Management wrote a couple of days ago, uh, it's all an illusion. And that it's going to, you know, the, uh, the, the rug is going to be pulled out from underneath you. Or Sam Zell here in Chicago was uh, recently quoted in the last few months. He thinks that if the Fed were to raise rates immediately, immediately, that two things would happen is that it, the economy would not fall apart, and people would see that it wouldn't fall apart, and there would be a huge burst of economic activity. Get rid of that feeling of artificialness, of manipulation, and then you would unleash the markets. Now, you tell the Fed this, and they think you've lost your mind. You're telling me that we need to raise rates to get the economy to go better. Forever and ever, the Fed has always been trained to cut rates to get the economy to go better. Well, that's till you get to the point where everybody thinks that what they're seeing and they're writing, like Paul, Sing, uh, Paul Singer did earlier this week, that they think what they're seeing is an illusion. That's what I think is holding back the structural reform, uh, the, the structural GDP gap. Um, and if I'm wrong on that, and there's a school of thought, that no, actually it is that metaphor that it broke its leg and it cannot get better, and that we're in a new world of lower growth. There's a new professor at Northwestern, Bob Gordon, who's been arguing this case too. It's just a new world of one and a half percent to one and three quarter percent is the new normal growth rate, not two and a half. The problem with that argument, not, or the, the implication of that argument, a better way to put it is, if you think that the S&P 500 at a 15 PE is fair value, what's the assumption there? Two and a half percent growth. But now if I lopped a third of growth off, now it's one and a half percent world. Well, maybe all of a sudden now 15 PE is overvalued. You know, look at the way people buy emerging markets. You buy into an emerging market that's growing 9 or 10 percent, you'll pay a 30 or 40 PE because you expect strong growth. But if you're gonna, if you're gonna go invest in Japan where PE grow, or where GDP growth is near zero, you're paying three, four, or five PEs for those companies because you expect lower growth. So if the growth rate is permanently damaged, and that's the argument that some make, then all of a sudden cap rates are too high, uh, PEs are too high, there's a valuation argument. Now, I don't believe that. I think what the problem is is that the Sam Zells of the world have said, look, I invest in companies, Sam Zell, this is the way he described it. When I go into a company, I'm in there for 10 years, maybe longer. I don't know what's going to happen. The Fed's going to pull the rug out from underneath me. They're going to make a mistake. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And I'm stuck owning a railroad for the next seven years. I don't own stocks where I can call somebody up and some computer can sell them in the next four seconds. But if you got rid of the Fed and you raised rates and things looked normal, I'd be much more aggressive. And I think a lot of other people have made that argument too. That's how you would close the gap, is the Fed needs to get out of the manipulation game and let the economy prove to people that the economy is doing well. Now, implied in there is I do think it's doing well, but I understand that they're afraid to go all in because they're afraid that if they go all in and things go south because it was all manipulated, they're left holding the bag. And that's where I think the, the problem with the gap comes in, and that's where I think the problem is going to stay for a while because the Fed's not ready to get out anytime soon. So let me flip and ask about inflation. We've got another student in our audience today of Milton Friedman who says that we also learned from Milton Friedman, and he's quoting, inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Uh, the question is, uh, why uh, hasn't inflation started with QE, uh, with uh, the Fed buying enough uh, bonds to finance the annual budget deficit? And so what will uh, cause it to, uh, what will trigger it? When will it happen? I, I would answer the question everywhere and always a monetary phenomena in that in 2014, in the United States especially, the definition of money is not knowable right now. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when Friedman made that statement, m most credit came from the banking system. And you could do measures like M1, M2, M3, and you could look at the expansion and the definition of money was more defined. Today, there are places you can get loans, you can have loans, you can create credit that are well outside the reach of the Federal Reserve, well outside the reach of the banking system. So the, so the, the first question is, it's everywhere and always a, mon a monetary phenomenon. I agree with that, except we can't measure money anymore. 
So the lack of inflation must tell us that the, that the amount of money in the world is not growing fast enough to create that inflation, probably because we destroyed so much credit from 2007 to 2009, we haven't made that all back up. Um, this is a little different in, in China. China is still more of a traditional bank lending kind of economy as opposed to where we are right now. And so that's one of the reasons why I don't think you, you, you're getting the inflation that you've seen. And that is definitely the case in Europe and in Japan. They're creating money in the banking system, but it's not really coming out of the banking system in terms of more credit, and that's why you don't get the inflation. To be honest with you, I don't know how you're going to get the, the inflation. Boy, the central banks have tried as hard as they can to create it, and they're not going to be able to create it at this point. So that's one of the reasons why I said earlier, if zero is not perceived as a problem because inflation is not perceived as a problem, I don't see the Fed in any hurry to raise rates. Uh, so that's why I think it's going to be much longer than we thought. We have time for one more question, and we've had some good ones from the audience. Uh, here's one that says, please comment on Bill Gross's recent commentary on central banks and the financial system. Um, I would hope, you, I think you're talking about the one that he put out a couple of days ago at Janus, uh, in that, I, as I understand uh, Bill's argument, it's kind of along the same lines that, that I was arguing as well, too. QE isn't doing anything for the real world, jobs and GDP. As such, you will continue to have falling inflation, lackluster growth. And by the way, in that lackluster growth, remember I said that the U.S. is a C minus? That's the highest grade in the world right now. So everybody else is worse. <laughs> but, you know, so if we were grading on a curve, we would definitely be an A. Uh, but, but I don't think we want to really grade it on a curve. It's a D, it's a D in uh, Europe, and it's definitely an F in uh, Japan, and it might be a D in China as well, too, or a D minus in China. Uh, and so his argument has been that the inflation is not going to be produced, the central bank is going to be there, and why do you see how low interest rates are going to go, if I'm understanding his argument correctly, and that there is a much lower pull on interest rates around the world. And by implication, what he's also saying, and this is one of the reasons why people are having a rethink about U.S. interest rates, at 2.3%, the U.S. tenure among major sovereign countries is the highest interest rate in the world. Europe is 80 basis points, 85, I'm sorry, Germany is 85 basis points. It's 40 basis points, less than half a percent in Switzerland. It's 60 basis points in Japan. And so there is a big pull then if the rest, of, if we can't create growth, we can't create inflation, and we're just going to continue to print money in Europe and Japan and push down those interest rates, the natural reaction of investors are going to be, I don't want to buy 80 basis point 10-year yields in Germany. I'll sell those to the central bank, and I'll go buy 230 interest rates in the U.S., and they might push us down to 2%. And that's one of the reasons why in that one chart, that capitulation is that thinking is now starting to filter into the market that 100% that belief that interest rates were going to go up is now, I think, coming into doubt uh, after what we've seen happen and then that 185 dive. No, they can go down. Why? Because they have, and they've gone down quite a bit even though everybody thought they were going to go down. So I, I think that's how I'd um, interpret what Bill has been saying. Well, thank you. Great discussion. Uh, Jim is going to stick around uh, for those of you that have additional questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We've really enjoyed putting this program together. We hope you found it to be meaningful. Uh, you know, we titled our event today, Overcoming Challenges and Finding Opportunities in the Age of Information Overload. And Anna Nichols, our Director of Communications, thank you for all your hard work and for coming up with that title. Uh, but hopefully we've all gained some useful takeaways that will help us move from data and information deluge to a more focused approach uh, to how we take in and utilize the information that is truly at our fingertips. And as Richard spoke at the very beginning of our program today, uh, Altair serves clients first and foremost as an investment manager but we use that expertise to help our clients make decisions about their lives. We hope our program today went above and beyond, and our special thanks to Devra and to Jim and uh, Jason, and we appreciate your coming. If you parked, grab a parking uh, coupon.